Chauncey Warner Porter, 1812 to 1868, farmer, millwright, sawyer, carpenter, and shoemaker. Chauncey Warner Porter was born October 20th of 1812 at Holland, Erie County, New York, the first of 13 children born to Sanford and Nancy Warner Porter. His middle name, Warner, of course, comes from his mother's maiden name. At the time of his birth, his father was serving in the War of 1812. The Porter family has received a great heritage by their lives, and we are especially grateful for the autobiography written by Sanford Porter, which consists of over 200 pages. It is most helpful in showing Chauncey's early life and movements. Chauncey moved with his parents to Augusta, Oneida County, New York, where his sister Melinda was born, the 3rd of November, 1814. They next moved to Plymouth, Oneida County, New York, where his sister Sarah was born, the 11th of September, 1816, and his brother, John President, was born there, July 28th of 1818. The family next moved to Corinth, Orange County, Vermont, where Chauncey's brother Nathan was born, July the 10th, 1820, and then the family moved back to Augusta, where Chauncey's brother Reuben was born in May of 1822. Chauncey next moved to Vienna Liberty Township, Trumbull County, Ohio, where his brother Sanford Jr. was born, June 25th of 1823. Chauncey is now age 10, and typical of pioneer life would be performing numerous chores on the farm. His father gives us an interesting insight into his son's ability to learn quickly and to work hard when he stays. It was but a few days before my wife laid in with a little daughter. It was a time of sickness with little infants and children. They would be taken with what was called croup or rattles and choke and turn purple, for they were so filled with phlegm they couldn't breathe. Our little baby was taken with it. I went up to the old widow Johnson's and got her to nurse the child. She gave the child a dose of lobelia. I hired a man to help move us to Peoria County. I rented about 10 acres of plain land off of a widow. Chauncey W., my oldest son, was about 12 years old. He could plow the ground, for the man was very handy. He could plow without any driver. He plowed and we planted. Sanford's autobiography states, In 1827, we again sold our all, this time for the purpose of journeying toward the land of the setting sun, to the fertile country of the Illinois in company of a Mr. John Morgan. We constructed a flat boat, which we launched on the Mahoning River, not far from our home at Liberty. Loading it with our effects, we floated down the Mahoning, then into the Beaver, then into and down the Ohio, this journey was fraught with danger and adventure as the country was wild and uninhabited, but our first danger was going over the falls of the Beaver River some distance above its confluence with the Ohio. As we neared the falls, we drew to shore and disembarked all the women and children, in fact, all except Mr. Morgan and two pilots, leaving them with the boat, and the rest followed down the stream, watching the boat with intense interest as it drew near the suck which plunged it over the falls. For a few moments we thought all was lost, but she soon came in sight, right side up, and no material damage was done. On the 4th of May, 1827, we disembarked near Evansville, Indiana, and we rented a farm of a Mr. Gentry and planted a crop, after which I took very sick, and for a while my life was despaired of. But at length I began to amend and became strong enough to teach school that winter. Then in March 1828, we again took up our march toward Illinois. The wagon we hauled our belongings in, although common in those pioneer days, would seem very novel in the construction at the present time. It was built in the form of a truck, the wheels being made of pine logs mortised together with a large hole through the axle for the linchpin. We used tallow for wagon grease. With this rude construction drawn by two yoke of oxen, we traveled northwest from Evansville, crossing the Wabash River into Illinois. We had very stormy weather, as is usual in that part of the country in early spring. 
One night we spent in the hollow base of a large tree, finding protection from the cold wind with a fair degree of comfort. After crossing the Wabash, we were joined by a Mr. Baldwin Clark and family who had made previous arrangements to join our company when we should reach that point. Thus we pursued our journey into Tazewell County, Illinois. As we journeyed on, we were filled with wonder and admiration at the beautiful country lying before us as far as the eye could see, covered with luxuriant growth of natural vegetation. We journeyed on, crossing the Sangamon River and arriving at our destination sometime in June. We camped about three miles from the Illinois River and Peoria up the river about eight miles on the west bank of the Tazewell River. After exploring the country with the Mr. Morris Phelps, we took up a farm about three miles east of the town. Although in a fertile country, we had many perplexities to meet, as is the case in a new country. Everything must be made at home, utensils, farming implements, shoes, clothing, etc. We had to work on the principle, if you want anything, make it, and few tools to work with. Chauncey, at age 15, moved with his family to an area about three miles east of Pekin, Tazewell County, Illinois, where his brother Justin was born May 18th of 1828. Chauncey's father, Sanford, in his autobiography, gives us some further details of interest for this time in Chauncey's life. We stopped at Farm Creek, and Mr. Clark bought a farm there. I did not like it there very well, for I could see that many farms were deserted on account of that creek getting wicked in the spring, and piling heaps of wood and deep sand on the farms after the crops had been dug up several inches. So I went further up onto the edge of the prairie, and found a place that pleased me very well, about 40 acres covered with beautiful white oak, thrifty and good-sized with a good road running from the Wabash to Port Clark, now called Peoria. I moved my family up there, and once more we went to clearing land and making logs to build a house, a barn, pigsty, and other things, to plow again and to plant and to reap and get ready for winter. We had plenty of work to do, and then some. I got Morris Phelps to help me, and Chauncey W., my boy, now coming of 16, was a smart lad at everything, so we made good progress. And by winter time, we were quite comfortable. After we had been here a while, Morris and I thought we would go in partners and build a sawmill, each standing half of the expense and sharing half of the profits. There were but two mills in an area of 30 or 40 miles. We saw no reason why we should not pick up a good business. The country was settling up fast and all the newcomers would all need lumber and such to build their homes. Everything went along fine until it came time to make the water wheel. When it was all ready, Morris rolled a log about a foot through onto a carriage, hoisted the gate, and let the water in as big as you please. She ran up quick enough, but when she came down and hit the wheel, she stopped. The wheel would not turn fast enough to even start the saw. Well, Morris worked at that thing until he got tired out and red in the face and sweating all over and then quit. He told me I could have the damn thing if I would take over the debts he was owing. If your debts aren't more than your half or share, I will take them over for you, provided your creditors are willing to take me as a paymaster. That man would go in debt for good and fancy clothes just as long as people would trust him. I told him I'd never ask any living man for one dollar trust unless we hadn't a crumb in the house to eat. A man by the name of Camelin owned one of the mills I have spoken of, and when spring came, he went to Peoria and told all the merchants and everyone I was owing on account of taking over Morris's debts and that they would never get a penny out of me. For as soon as the snow started melting, the water would come down so fast that every inch of my mill would go downstream. I heard of this, went over to Peoria, and told my creditors not to worry about what I owed them until they heard my mill had gone out. Then they could set the law on me. Well, I sought enough lumber between the 1st of April and the middle of June to settle up everything I owed and some to spare. I stepped out of the house one morning to go to the mill and met two strange men. We passed the time of day, and one of them handed me a letter, sealed. I opened it and found it was for Morris Phelps, 
who then lived on the DuPage, about 30 miles from Chicago. My friend tells me you are preachers of a new profession. We will walk into the house, gentlemen. I bade them remove their knapsacks and be seated and ask if they had been to breakfast. They had not. I then told my women folk to prepare a good breakfast for these gentlemen and asked them to excuse me while I went to the mill to see how the boys were coming on with the work and said I would soon be back. My son Chauncey had learned remarkably well and fast how to handle logs, mind the saw, sharpen it, and in fact the order of everything pertaining to the mill. He had outstanding gifts along that line and many others. I told the boys respecting the new preachers and that I must go to them so they must watch very closely that which they did. Morris told me in his letter that these men had been preaching in their neighborhood and had set the Methodist, Baptist, and every other religious profession in an uproar, and he wanted me to search them to the bottom and find out, if possible, what their belief was and write him my conclusion. I went back to the house and said, Well, gentlemen, I am ready to hear you expound your doctrine. They told me that they had a prophet, seer, and revelator, that they had apostles, and that their church was organized just as the ancient church of Christ was organized, that they had the same gifts, the same power to heal the sick and to cast out devils, the power to ordain every male member to the priesthood, and that these men were given authority to preach the gospel to every nation and kindred tongue and people. If people believed and repented of their sins, the elders of their church were commanded to baptize them by immersion in water and to lay their hands upon their heads and bestow upon them the gift of the Holy Ghost, which would lead them into all truth. As they talked, I surely prayed in my heart that what they were telling me was true. They showed me a new book they had with them and explained where and how it was obtained. I took the book and together we searched it. For three days and nights, almost without sleep, we searched it. I asked them what their interpretation was to many passages of Scripture. About daylight of the third night, I told them I had asked all the questions I could think of, and they wanted to know what I thought of their doctrine. If you have told me all the truth, gentlemen, and I have not the least doubt of it, your church is the right church and the only one on the face of the whole earth. A different account adds the following. About the year 1829, I and Morris Phelps and John Cooper commenced the creation of a sawmill on Farm Creek about three miles from my home. But before the mill was put in successful operation, I and my two sons purchased the interests of the other two parties. But finding it difficult to run both farm and mill, we sold our farm and moved to the mill, where we resided till 1831. It was while living on the mill on Farm Creek that we became converted to the Mormon faith, joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 10 August, 1831. We were converted and baptized by Lyman White and John Carrill. The following quote from the book Charles C. Rich by Leonard J. Arrington helps fill in some interesting gaps concerning the conversion and baptism of Chauncey, who was baptized August 10, 1831 the same day as his parents, Sanford and Nancy, and two of his sisters, Melinda and Sarah. In the spring of 1830, Joseph Rich settled on Farm Creek about three miles from Fort George Rogers Clark, which lay to the west on the other side of the Illinois River. Fort Clark, later called Peoria, had only a few log cabins and the remains of a fort that had been partially destroyed in 1818. As yet, Illinois settlers were reluctant to establish themselves on the extensive prairie lands of the state with their fertile soil and tough sod. Rather, they cleared wooded land along the rivers and creeks. The only neighbors the riches had at that time were the families of Morris Phelps and Sanford Porter Sr., both of whom would play important roles in Charles Rich's life. Morris Phelps later recalled that the country was filled with Indians, but not very hostile more than to rob the few inhabitants of their bread and frequently steal our horses. Charles spent from August to October in Indiana working to pay for the 80 acres rich land claim. He arrived home in time to experience one of the most severe winters in Illinois history. In Tazewell County, snow fell to a depth of four feet on the level and 18 to 20 feet in drifts. A period of extreme cold followed the temperature sometimes dropping as low as 10 to 20 degrees below zero. Cattle and many wild animals perished. 
Rich's neighbors were first to become concerned about religious questions. Morris Phelps thought much about religion, but was troubled by a personal experience of his friend Sanford Porter. Phelps related, he had a vision some years previous and was shown or told that all the different churches on the whole earth were wrong, that the Lord did not acknowledge any of them, but that the Lord would establish his church again on the earth and that it would be established in his Porter's day. It would gather out the honest in heart of all nations. In the rehearsal of this vision, I discovered an honest sincerity that he had seen a vision. I was in more trouble of mind than before. I read the Bible much, yet my mind was veiled, and I was afforded no relief. My mind, about three and a half years, was thus afflicted. After selling his property in Tazewell County and moving to Chicago in late 1830, Phelps returned to his former home for a visit in 1831 and while there received a letter from one of his Ohio relatives about a new church. She wrote concerning a new book called the Book of Mormon, that it was translated from writings on plates, said to be done by the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, and the plates were of pure gold found by the direction of an angel in New York State. The news burned deep within Phelps, and he shared it with his close friends. On reading of this new church and a prophet created such a curiosity and anxiety mingled with joy that I could not refrain from weeping. The next day I read concerning the new book, The Book of Mormon, to Charles C. Rich. He also was anxious to learn more concerning the new book, Church and Prophet. I also read the letter to Mr. Porter, who also was enthusiastically overjoyed. Phelps returned home early in July and had just completed writing a letter to inquire about the new book, Church and Prophet, when an acquaintance, James Emmett, rode up with two Mormon preachers who were on foot in traveling costume, knapsack, and valise on their backs. Emmett arranged for the two, Lyman White and John Carrill, to preach at Phelps' house that evening and the following morning. The two Mormons preached before an audience of about 20, including Phelps and his wife and several of their neighbors, and baptized James Emmett. As the missionaries left, Morris Phelps gave them a letter of introduction to his former neighbor, Sanford Porter. Thereupon, Phelps recalls Lyman White prophesied, We shall baptize Mr. Porter and ordain him an elder and he will come here four weeks from today and will preach here and will baptize all four of you meaning myself and wife, Laura, and John Cooper and wife. The two women were sisters. The missionaries proceeded to Tazewell County, where in August Charles C. Rich recalled, Lyman White and John Carrill preached the gospel in our neighborhood. Sanford Porter was indeed baptized, and he baptized Morris Phelps that same month. Sanford tells us more about Chauncey. Chauncey W. Porter, my eldest son, was sent ahead February 1832 with the first wagon and two yoke of oxen hitched to it and was told to stop at a certain sandbar more than halfway across the Mississippi River and there wait until the main body of the company came up. But he disobeyed our instructions and drove on across while many people on both sides of the river were holding their breath in fear. But he went over all right and a shout of wonder and surprise went up from the people, and many said they saw the ice rise and fall in waves behind the wagon. But more care was taken when crossing the rest of the company. They all crossed the sandbar one team at a time, then unhitched the teams and drove them over, then hitched a horse at the end of the tongue to distribute the weight to as long a distance as possible. In that way, we all crossed in safety by 10 o'clock. After journeying a number of days in the state of Missouri, a halt was made to give the teams a much-needed rest. The next day, we resumed our journey. We crossed the Missouri River at Arrow Rock, which is east from Kansas City, and nearly halfway across the state from Kansas City. The crossing of the river was made by ferry boat, and owing to the swift current at that place, considerable judgment and care was necessary in order to make a soft landing. Shortly after crossing the river, we were met by Morris Phelps returning from Independence with the means he had been sent for, and on March 1, 1832, we arrived at our destination after a cold and tedious journey and the hazardous crossing of the rivers. But by the blessings of the God of Israel, we were all alive and well, and happily united with those of our faith and feeling fully repaid for all the hardships we had endured. 
We found that great things were laid out for the people to do. In the first place, the saints were required to live by the law of consecration or stewardship, as they did in the days of Enoch. We expected to reside in peace until the second coming of the Savior, and we were to build a magnificent temple to his most holy name. The majority of the people voted to sustain the prophet Joseph in his plans. The temple block was then covered with a thick growth of timber, but the brethren went to work with a will, clearing off the timber, using it for building and other purposes. Four branches of the church had been organized to the west of Independence, extending out to a distance of 12 or 14 miles, mainly Big Blue, Timber, Colville, and Prairie. I and my family located at the last named place, being assigned about 20 acres to the family. The labor of assigning of the land was in the hands of Bishop Edward Partridge. We went to work immediately, clearing land and building houses. But the seed of contention once started spread in our own community, but with those not of our own faith, and strife ran to such a degree that we were driven from our homes without court or counsel and that at the point of the bayonet and the muzzle of the gun. In 1833, we were driven in a body from our newly made homes. We then went into Caldwell and other counties to make homes, but not for long were we allowed to enjoy them. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints soon found there was no place in the United States where it could dwell in peace. On the 12th of November, 1833, while the main body of the saints who had been hurriedly driven from their homes were camped on the south bank of the Missouri River with no way of making an immediate crossing, and the mob who had driven us were still in pursuit, and as they said they were under a pledge to kill men, women, and children as soon as overtaken, a heavy storm came up, and the guards said the mob were upon us. But before they began to attack, the storm broke in meteoric violence, the worst that any of us had ever seen, and in seeming fear the mob fled from their intended victories, and we looked upon the storm as a miraculous deliverance by the hand of God. To describe the storm, it looked like the stars were falling thickly for a while, then only a few would fall, then it would renew its violence and fall thickly again. So it kept up until nearly dawn before it ceased. Instead of crossing with the main body of the saints, I with a few others traveled south and camped at the head of the Osage River. We then traveled down the south fork for some distance. Then our little company of about 15 families camped for the winter. I was among my bitter enemies with no money to buy with. Chauncey married Amy Sumner, December 6th, 1833, at Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. Amy Sumner was born February 22, 1815, at Derby, Kings Creek, Champaign County, Ohio, the daughter of Jonathan Sumner and Susanna Lundy. Alma Porter, their first child, was born December 15, 1834, at the North Fork of the Grand River, Van Buren, Carter County, Missouri. He married Minerva Adeline Duell, November 15, 1858, and Sarah Jane Carter, November 10, 1882. Melinda Ann Porter was their second child, born July 9, 1836, also at the North Fork of the Grand River. She married Sanford Porter, Jr., her father's brother, July 25, 1852. Chauncey and Amy moved to Caldwell County, Missouri in 1838, where Chauncey was ordained an elder. To whom it may concern, this certifies that Warner Porter has been received into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized on the 6th of April in the year of our Lord 1830, and has been ordained an elder according to the rules and regulations of the said church, and is duly authorized to preach the gospel agreeably to that office, given by the direction of a general conference of the authorities of the said church assembled in the city of Far West Missouri, the 6th of April in the year of the Lord 1838. George M. Robinson, clerk, Joseph Smith, Jr., president received the 1st of June, 1838, and recorded the same day. William Porter, 
was born November 5, 1838, at Caldwell, Missouri. He died September 25, 1840, age one. He was Chauncey's third child. Chauncey and family moved to Green Plains, Hancock County, Illinois, where Sarah Angeline Porter, their fourth child, was born September 14, 1841. She married George Levitt, March 20, 1857. Chauncey and family next moved to Jefferson, Lee County, Iowa, where Nancy Aretta Porter, their fifth child, was born October 1, 1843. She married Nelson Bates Matthijs, February 4, 1861. Chauncey was ordained and high priest at Nauvoo by Samuel Bent. Hiram Smith Porter was born March 15, 1845 at Jefferson, Lee County, Iowa and died aged seven months, October 16, 1845. Chauncey and Amy were endowed in the Nauvoo Temple on January 1, 1846. It must have been extra special since Chauncey had assisted in the building of the temple. Amy Sumner was sealed to Chauncey Warner Porter in the Nauvoo Temple on January 22, 1846. It should be noticed that the name Emma Sumner appears in the sealing records as shown by her temple index bureau card and the original sealing entry. Chauncey and Amy moved westward once again as the saints were driven from Illinois and with their family leave in February of 1846 passing famous landmarks on their way. Chauncey married Lydia Ann Cook March 6, 1846 at Winter Quarters, which is now Florence, Douglas County, Nebraska. Lydia was born August 6, 1830, at Peoria, Peoria County, Illinois, the daughter of Ahaz and Hannah Sherwood Cook. According to Jensen's Encyclopedic History of the Church, in December 1846, the place consisted of 548 log houses and 83 sod houses inhabited by 3,483 souls. The place was also divided into 22 wards, each presided over by a bishop. Chauncey Warner Porter was one of these 22 bishops. Joseph Porter was born December 11, 1846, at Winter Quarters, the son of Chauncey by his first wife, Amy, their seventh child. He died the next day, December 12, 1846, and is listed in Andrew Jensen's book, Tragedy at Winter Quarters. Benjamin Porter, the twin brother of Joseph, was born December 11, 1846, at Winter Quarters. He was Chauncey and Amy's eighth child. He also died the next day. Lydia Ann Cook was sealed to Chauncey Warner Porter March 28, 1847 at Winter Quarters. Amy Sumner Porter, first wife of Chauncey Warner Porter, died April 6, 1847 at Winter Quarters. The official burial entry shows that she died aged 32 years one month and 14 days. The cause of death is listed as scurvy. She is buried in grave number 125. Priscilla Strong became Chauncey Warner Porter's third wife. They were married February 10, 1848 at Winter Quarters. Priscilla was born December 11, 1830 at Sheldon Township, Genesee County, New York, the daughter of Ezra and Olive Lowell Strong. Priscilla was also sealed to Chauncey on the same day, and Lydia Ann Cook was sealed again at this time, as shown by the original sealing record. Warner Ahaz Porter was born May 20, 1848, at Winter Quarters. He was Chauncey's ninth child and the first by his second wife, Lydia Ann Cook. Mary Melinda Norwood was Warner's first wife, married October 5th, 1867. 
Martha Norwood was his second wife, married July 21, 1873, and Rachel Ann Black was his third wife, married April 23, 1879. Chauncey Warner Porter and his two families left winter quarters for the Salt Lake Valley in the spring of 1848, and as with the other pioneers who have crossed the plains, they traversed the level lands of Nebraska, past North Platte, Nebraska, along the Platte River to Chimney Rock, which marked the halfway point, then on to Independence Rock, Fort Laramie, Wyoming, and then on to Fort Bridger, the famous trading post. Chauncey and his two families entered the Salt Lake Valley in September of 1848. The official church records show that the company arrived between September 20th and September 24th. Some family records show 1849 and others October of 1848, but they are in error. The records indicate that they came by ox team and not as one of the handcart companies. Bancroft in his History of Utah adds the following concerning the 1848 crossing of the plains. The organized emigration from the Missouri River to Great Salt Lake City in 1848 was divided into three divisions in charge of the first presidency of the church namely, 1st Division in charge of President Brigham Young, 2nd Division in charge of President Heber C. Kimball, 3rd Division in charge of President Willard Richards. The 1st Division was comprised of 1,229 souls and had with them 397 wagons, 74 horses, 19 mules, 1,275 oxen, 699 cows, 184 loose cattle, 411 sheep, 141 pigs, 605 chickens, 37 cats, 82 dogs, 3 goats, 10 geese, 2 hives of bees, 8 doves, and 1 crow. This division left the Elkhorn River June 1, 1848, and arrived in Great Salt Lake City September 20th to 24th, 1848. Heartthrobs of the West lists our porters as being in the 1st Division, Brigham Young's company, and they are listed as Chauncey, Lydia, Priscilla, Alma, Melinda Ann, Sarah, Nancy Aretta, and Warner Ahaz. Bancroft, in his History of Utah, adds, Moving west in early June, on the 14th, the immigrants were fired on by the Indians, two being wounded. At this time there was also sickness in the camp. Before the expiration of the year, there were nearly 3,000, including the pioneers, the battalion men and the companies that arrived under Parley P. Pratt, at least 5,000 of the saints assembled in the valley. Thus about one-fourth of the exiles from Nauvoo were for the present beyond the reach of molestation. That 5,000 persons, including a very large proportion of women and children, almost without money, almost without provisions, accepting the milk of their kind, and the grain which they had raised near their own camps should almost without loss of a life have accomplished this journey of more than 1,200 miles, crossing range after range of mountains, bridging rivers, and transversing deserts, while liable at any moment to be attacked by a roaming band of savages, is one of the marvels that this century has witnessed. To those who met them on the route, the strict order of their march their coolness and their rapidity in closing ranks to repel assault, their method of posting sentries around camp and corral, suggested rather the movements of a well-organized army than the migration of a people. And in truth, few armies have been better organized or more ably led than was this army of the Lord. To the skill of their leaders and their concert of purpose and action was due their preservation. And now, at length, they had made good their escape from the land of bondage to the promised land of their freedom, in which, though a wilderness, they rejoiced to dwell. After crossing the plains in the 1st Division, Brigham Young's company, Chauncey settled at Mill Creek, Salt Lake County, and ran the Gardner Brothers Sawmill at what is now Porter's Fork of Mill Creek Canyon. Chauncey Union Porter was born March 17, 1850, at Mill Creek. He was Chauncey's tenth child and first by his third wife, Priscilla. 
Chauncey Union married Favorite Rich November 11, 1872, and Marietta Saylor became his second wife August 22, 1903. Charles Porter was born June 22, 1850, by Lydia at Mill Creek. He was Chauncey's 11th child. He died the same month. Cynthia Canyonis Porter was born June 22, 1850, a twin sister to Charles. She married Evan Jones April 13, 1869. Marie Porter Gratian adds the following. It was while living in the above location that the Indians came in to visit. Although they were well fed and the chief gave instructions not to molest any of the white brothers, but alas, one big brave went on the warpath and came to the home with his hunting knife with the purpose of scalping Father Chauncey. Help was summoned, and the incident was reported to the chief. Therefore, no one ever saw the big buck again, and Chauncey's blessings were greater. David Daniel Porter, born 27th June, 1851, by Priscilla, was Chauncey's 13th child, also born at Mill Creek. He died the same day. Amy Zenora Porter was born... May 4, 1852, by Lydia. She was Chauncey's 14th child, and she was also born at Mill Creek. She married John President Porter, Jr., October 5, 1867. Brentha Priscilla Porter was born August 29, 1852, by Priscilla. She was born at Mill Creek and was Chauncey's 15th child. She married Charles William Simpson, March 1, 1878. She married Austin Egbert Herrick, October 24, 1888. Chauncey received his patriarchal blessing April 8, 1853 by John Smith, the church patriarch. The blessing is on file at the church historical department and any direct descendant of Chauncey can obtain a copy if they so desire. Justin Rockford Porter was born October 16, 1853 by Lydia and was Chauncey's 16th child. He was born at Salt Lake City and married Mary Mariah Porter, May 11, 1874. He married second Martha Jane Carling, April 2, 1925. Francis Lysander Porter was born July 4, 1854 by Priscilla and was Chauncey's 17th child. He was born at Mill Creek, Salt Lake County, Utah and married Mary Maria Hoyt, September 13, 1877. He also married second Laura Melvina Carling the same day, September 13, 1877. Abigail Ann Brown was his third wife, whom he married June 2, 1880. Chauncey and his wives moved to Centerville, Davis County, Utah, where his 18th child, Nancy Arvina Porter, was born September 20, 1855, by his wife Lydia. She married Sanford Porter Chipman September 19, 1870. On May 6, 1856, Chauncey Warner Porter's two wives, Lydia Ann Cook and Priscilla Strong, were sealed to him in the endowment house. These multiple sealings were common in the early days of the church when the original sealings were performed outside of a special temple or structure. They were told that after the beautiful sealing rooms of the endowment house were completed that they could have these sealings re-performed. Marietta Porter was Chauncey's 19th child by his wife Priscilla, born July 5, 1856, at Centerville, Davis County, Utah. She married Edward Cross, May 29, 1876. Mary Ziona Porter was Chauncey's 20th child. She was born April 25, 1857 by Lydia at Centerville, Davis County, Utah, and died the same year. Chauncey and his families moved to Springville, Utah County, Utah in 1858 due to the coming of Johnston's army and the decision of Brigham Young and the Saints to place straw in their homes which could easily be touched off and burned in case Johnson's army did not meet their agreement to go through Salt Lake City but not to stay there. Melvin Omer Porter was Chauncey's 21st child by his wife Priscilla. He was born June 11, 1858 at Springville, Utah County, Utah. 
He died June 10, 1879, aged 20. Edson Darius Porter was born April 12, 1859, by Lydia, and born at Provo, Utah County, Utah. He was Chauncey's 22nd child and married Catherine Aurelia Carling, June 2, 1880. He married second Phoebe Melinda Carling, February 19, 1886. Chauncey and his family returned to Centerville, Davis County, Utah, in the summer of 1859. The town of Porterville received its name, writes the Morgan County News, of Friday, January 18, 1957, from the Porters, who first settled there. Warner and Sanford Porter, Jr. came over the mountains from Centerville, Davis County, into Hard Scrabble Canyon in 1854 and built a sawmill on Beaver Creek. They carried the necessary machinery and provisions on pack mules, Lumber was taken back over the mountain to Centerville on the cart with four yoke of oxen. In the spring of 1861, their father, Sanford Porter Sr., came from Centerville and settled in what is now Porterville. He built the first house in that part of the valley, brought his family there, and took up land. Warner and Sanford Jr. built houses that summer, and the following spring, John P. and Lyman, their brothers, also settled there. The first houses were near the present Curtis Carter residence and near the W.V. Shaw residence. Nancy and Melinda Porter Moffat has given us some interesting pen pictures of Porterville. Sometime around the year 1860, Grandfather and his four stalwart sons left Centerville to find a new place to homestead. They traveled north through Davis County until they reached the mouth of the rough, rugged Weber Canyon. They passed through the canyon and entered the Weber Valley, then drove south until they almost reached the extreme end. Here they came to the foot of a low hill or ridge. They rode up this hill, and when they had reached the top, they beheld a small but beautiful valley stretched out before them. It was near the foot of the first low hill that Grandfather dug out and leveled a place and built a two-room log house. In the main stream they found fish in abundance, mostly trout, and also wild ducks and geese. And as they went on up the stream to see about getting water on the land, they found the beaver, muskrats, and the mink. All three of these are a detriment to the farmer, as the beaver builds dams across the river and all dig holes in the bank. They decided this would make a good pastime for the boys, as the fur was very valuable. They could trap them and sell their hides, thus helping to build their new homes. The two Porter brothers, Warner and Sanford Jr., followed the stream up into the canyon they had named Hard Scrabble, making a road over boulders and rocks and dead brush until they had found a suitable place for a sawmill. In the canyon, they found the mountains covered with green and dry trees of all sizes. The tiny ones could be used for fence posts, the small ones for firewood, larger ones for house logs, and the largest ones for timbers. They soon had built a sawmill with an upright saw run by water. From pioneer history, I find Sanford carried material for the mill over the mountains from Salt Lake City on pack mules, a distance about 50 or 60 miles. It was here they made lumber for the first homes in Porterville, and the pioneers were finally able to have wood floors in their houses instead of dirt floors. Warner's two grown sons came from Centerville to help with the work. About 1865, they found suitable soil for bricks and began to burn bricks and build brick homes. The valley derived its name Porterville in honor of the Porter pioneers, and as the river and the Big Bank ran parallel along the middle of the valley, it was called East and West Porterville. The east side was settled by the porters and the west side by the English converts. The next step was to provide a suitable place for meeting and school. So the leading men on both sides got together and concluded that one large building would be sufficient for the time being. They all worked together and in a few days had a nice log building erected on the west side. Chauncey Warner Porter had been appointed as acting bishop. He gave the northwest corner of his farm for the purpose of erecting a church house and schoolhouse. 
In 1868, a brick building was completed and stood on the land at the beginning of the West Bank overlooking the grove of trees. Thus, they had a suitable building in the east and west Porterville for worshiping and schools. According to Jensen's Encyclopedic History of the Church, in the summer of 1860, Chauncey Warner Porter and Sanford Porter, Jr. joined their father on East Canyon Creek. Previous to this, in 1854, some of his family commenced the erection of a sawmill in Hard Scrabble Canyon. Regular LDS meetings were commenced in private cabins in charge of Chauncey W. Porter, who acted under the direction of Bishop Thomas Jefferson Thurston. Both branches were organized as separate bishops' wards in 1877. Carmine Nephi Porter was born October 31, 1860, by his wife Priscilla at Hardscrabble, Porterville, Morgan County, Utah. He was Chauncey's 23rd child and married Hannah Elizabeth Hoyt, June 9, 1882. The manuscript history of Porterville Ward states, A few more houses were built and regular meetings commenced in private houses under the presidency of Chauncey Warner Porter. He, being the oldest acting member of the family, very properly took the lead in the new settlement as presiding elder in the first stages of its growth. Porterville was a part of Bishop Thomas J. Thurston's ward. Elder Chauncey Warner Porter, the president of the branch, died in the spring of 1868, after which Lyman W. Porter took charge of the ecclesiastical affairs for a year or so. Omni Lehi Porter was Chauncey's 24th child, born January 27, 1861, by Lydia. He was born at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and died November 22, 1877, aged 16. David Nathaniel Porter was born February 23, 1863, by Priscilla, and was Chauncey's 25th child. He was born at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and died March 7, 1863. Annie Ozina Porter was born April 27, 1863 at Porterville, Morgan, Utah by his wife Lydia and was Chauncey's 26th child. She married Benjamin Daniel Black February 21, 1879. Wilford Woodruff Porter was born February 22, 1864 by Priscilla at Porterville, Morgan, Utah. He was Chauncey's 27th child. He married Johanna Grunick, September 22, 1892, and married second Mary V. Patton, January 16, 1936. Abinadi Porter was born March 28, 1865, by Lydia and was Chauncey's 28th child. He was born at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and married Annie Louisa Jensen, January 16, 1885. Olive Martha Porter was born April 29, 1866, by Priscilla at Porterville, Morgan, Utah. She was Chauncey's 29th child and died March 16, 1867, aged 10 months. Arvel Marion Porter was born April 20, 1867, by Lydia at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and died in 1867. He was Chauncey's 30th child. Ezra Solomon Porter was born December 1, 1867, by Priscilla at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and was Chauncey's 31st child. He married Martha Angeline Terman, August 12, 1890. Chauncey, Lydia, and Priscilla received their last blessings or second anointings in the endowment house in February of 1868. Chauncey died at the home of his brother, Nathan Tanner Porter, at Centerville, Utah, March 3, 1868, following a short illness induced by a severe cold he had contracted while on a visit to the endowment house in Salt Lake City. At the time of death, he had gotten as far as Centerville on his return to his home in Porterville. A letter written by Sarah D. Rich to Eliza Rich states, Dear Sister Eliza, I will now tell you that Warner Porter died yesterday at Centerville. Him and both of his wives took dinner here a week ago yesterday, but he looked more like a corpse than a living man. And John and Mary took dinner here at the same time, and Thomas and Harriet, but Warner could not go any farther than Centerville. He was very sickly this spring. The Deseret Weekly News, 
of March 18, 1868, states the following in his obituary notice. Chauncey Warner Porter, who died in Centerville at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the 3rd instance, was born October 20, 1812, in Erie County, New York, and was at his death 55 years, 4 months, and 14 days old. He moved with his father to Ohio and Illinois. He obeyed the gospel and gathered to Jackson County, Missouri, in the spring of 1832 and shared in the persecutions of the saints. He married Amy Sumner in 1833 and moved to Van Buren County, Missouri, thence to Lee County, Iowa, opposite Nauvoo, Illinois. He contributed to the building of the Nauvoo Temple and was driven in 1846 with the saints to winter quarters, where he acted as ward bishop and gathered to these valleys in 1848. He was a pioneer of Porterville, where he presided over the branch until he fell asleep in Jesus while on his way home after having received his last blessings in the house of the Lord. His remains were interred in Porterville, Morgan County, on Friday evening, the sixth instance. Lydia Bereft Porter was born after the death of her father, hence the name Bereft. She was born June 21, 1868, by Lydia at Porterville, Morgan, Utah, and died the same day. She was Chauncey's 32nd and last child. Chauncey Warner Porter was a proud father of 32 children by his three wives, eight children by his first wife, Amy Sumner, 13 by his second wife, Lydia Ann Cook, and 11 by his third wife, Priscilla Strong. Of his 32 children, 19 lived long enough to marry, and they averaged 11 children each, giving Chauncey 213 grandchildren, which must be some kind of a record. 47 of the grandchildren were by the children of his first wife, Amy Sumner, 109 by the children of his second wife, Lydia Ann Cook, and 57 by the children of his third wife, Priscilla Strong which includes two adopted children by Mary Etta Porter Croft. We are proud to honor Chauncey Warner Porter and his three wives who have left us such a great heritage, an example of hard work, integrity, love, and devotion to the cause of Zion and lives worthy of emulation by ourselves and our posterity.